Hello, everybody. So uh, welcome to our annual Woldowski Lecture. This is uh, really a high point for the school every year where, where we invite one of our nation's top intellectuals to, to, to speak about an important topic. And we're, we're very excited about tonight's program and very happy that everybody here could join us. Uh, just, just to remind you, right, we are the Goldman School of Public Policy. Despite the hard times, we're still going strong. And in fact, I would say that uh, in light of the hard times, our graduates are more needed than ever. And so we're, we're happy to have everybody here. And we're just enthusiastic uh, about our students and about your attendance and your participation in this event. So we're very happy tonight to have Rebecca Blank here to, to speak to us. I'm not going to say much because uh, the introductions will be done by, by others. But I would just like to say, uh, give you a word of welcome and uh, introduce Lee Friedman, my colleague and professor at the Goldman School of Public Policy, who is really the, the sort of father of this event and the organizer uh, year in and year out, who has brought us one fantastic speaker after another. So please welcome Lee Friedman. And um, we uh, welcome you here. And please join us for the reception after the event. Thank you, Steve, and uh, welcome, everybody. Um, <clears throat> this is the uh, 15th annual Aaron Woldowski Forum for Public Policy. Um, and I have two announcements to make before I tell you very briefly about this forum. Um, one is that uh, if you haven't yet turned off your cell phone, um, we are curious about your ringtone, but show it to us later. Um, and, and secondly, after the conclusion, at the conclusion of the lecture, there will be a reception outside, and you're all welcome to join us uh, for that. Um, Aaron Woldowski was one of the most distinguished political scientists of the 20th century. He was a founder of the scholarly public policy movement, uh, and he was the founding dean of the public policy school. He was an extraordinarily articulate person with strong views and often not popular ones. He engaged scholars from all disciplines in a manner that was public, critical, uh, and at the same time warm and exciting and productive to the thinking of those present. Uh, he really personified the concept of intellectual community. Um, and to honor Aaron, we created this living memorial, the Aaron Woldowski Forum. Um, our intent is to bring intellectual excitement and community to the campus, just as Aaron so often brought to us. We've had many distinguished speakers, like sociologist William Julius Wilson, psychologist Nobel and Nobel laureate Danny, Danny Kahneman, uh, Stanford law professor Kathleen Sullivan, uh, we have the Woldowski Book Forum series, published by UC Press. Recent books include Godly Republic by University of Pennsylvania political scientist John Giulio, um, about government support of faith-based programs. Um, and another book, Falling Behind, How Rising Inequality Harms the Middle Class, by Cornell economist and New York Times columnist Robert Frank. Uh, soon to come out is the book Bounded Rationality in Politics by Stanford political scientist John Bender, uh, and others are in the works. So we have not just speeches, but we have, we have real books that you can, you can get your hands into and think about these things. Um, I'd like to offer my thanks to the members of the Woldowski Forum Selection Committee, Professors Robert Reich and Rucker Johnson and Laura Stoker, for their careful work and for their fine choice of this year's speaker. Uh, I'd also like to thank Interim Dean Steve Raphael for his support of the forum, and Lynn Serta Price for all of her logistical work in helping to make the arrangements for this event, and the staff and the student volunteers for all of their assistance in implementation. Um, our format is to have a lecture this evening uh, with time for audience questions, and comments. There are little cards in your program, and at any time during the lecture, if a question occurs to you, just write it down on the card, and there will be volunteers on both aisles collecting them from you 
uh, and at the end we'll, we'll have a question and answer period. Um, tomorrow morning, um, um, our Dean Designate Henry Brady, um, excuse me, our, our Dean Designate Henry Brady was well, going to moderate the question and answer tonight. Tomorrow morning from 9 a.m. to 11, we'll have a discussion at GSBP in the seminar room in the new building, room 355, from 9 to 11. Um, and you're welcome to attend that as well. I will be moderating that. Um, and professors Robert Reich and Steve Raphael of Public Policy and Professor Mike Hout from the Sociology Department will all be offering their reactions to, to this evening's address. And following our speaker's response to them, the floor will then be open for whoever is there. Um, and now to introduce our Wildowski Forum speaker, please welcome Dean Designate Henry Brady. In this room, don't say the word dean, because there's a whole bunch of people who have been interim deans, designated deans, all sorts of kinds of deans of the public policy school. It's my great pleasure and great honor to introduce Rebecca Blank. Rebecca is one of those people who ha can do and has done, it seems, just about everything. Uh, she's been a professor of economics at Princeton, Northwestern, University of Michigan, and now she's senior fellow at the Brookings uh, Institution in uh, Washington, D.C. But she's also been co-director of the National Center uh, for Poverty Research at the University of Michigan, member of the Council of Economic Advisors and during the Clinton years, the founding dean and enormously successful dean of the Gerald R. Ford School of Public Policy at the University of Michigan. But actually, most importantly, since I was a graduate student at MIT, I found out that she was president of the MIT Graduate Economics Association. So that, that's an illustrious post, as I remember. She's justifiably accumulated a lot of uh, honors and awards. She's a fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. She's been vice president of the American Economic Association. She's been president of the Association for Public Policy and Management and many other honors. Her scholarly work includes uh, a whole bunch of books, uh, about uh, nine books, uh, almost 100 articles and book chapters. She's worked on all sorts of different topics, poverty measurement, measuring uh, discrimination, studying and assessing welfare reform and other government programs for poor people, uh, labor markets especially for those who are lower wage workers, and setting an agenda for fighting poverty. But Rebecca has not only done lots of things, and she's not only published a lot of things, She's also engaged in public outreach. She's testified before Congress numerous times. She's done lots of op-ed pieces. But perhaps most unusually, and something that really struck a chord with me, is she's written articles on topics such as a feminist perspective on economic man. Feminist perspective on economic man. I like that. <laughs> Economics, policy analysis, and feminism. And on linking Christian faith and modern economic life. Or is the market moral? Interesting question. A dialogue on religion, economics, and justice. As a former seminarian, which I am, I'm especially struck by Rebecca's engagement with religion. And it seems to me, in these troubled, difficult times, we need someone who can bring faith, which she obviously has, knowledge she has, commitment, and economics together to figure out what is happening and what, what we should be doing to solve our problems. I give you an extraordinary person, Rebecca Blank, who will talk on changing inequality, a moral issue if there ever was one. Rebecca. It is an honor to be here. Um, I actually met Aaron Wildowski only once in my life, I believe, though of course, like many of the rest of us, I've read quite a few of his publications. I've had the honor to uh, work with his son at Brookings and gotten to know him a little bit. It is always a pleasure to come out to the Goldman School and to come out to Berkeley, and there are many old friends here, as well as a few new ones, and, and, and it's just fun um, to spend a day like this. I particularly like this format, where tomorrow we get to sit down and, and actually really talk about the details of some of this, and um, you know, I get to get some criticisms, um, as, as well as hearing what people liked about 
the whole thing. Um, I have apologies to you who I've got a copy of this paper because it turned out to be much more than a paper, as some of you know. Um, sort of the deal with this lecture is that one is supposed to publish a monograph at some point in the future, and a monograph is a book. And um, so in the process of putting this together, I, I, I thought I was starting by, you know, I'm going to write a short paper, and then who knows how I'll turn it into a book. And it's turned out to be a 107-page manuscript, so it's uh, getting close. But um, I'm, I fear that the um, discussants tomorrow morning um, have perhaps a little bit more to read than they um, had hoped for. Um, anyway, this is a lecture in several parts. Um, so let me talk about um, what I'm going to do in terms of changing inequality. And I mean those terms in two ways. One, how is inequality changing? And secondly, how do we, um, as a society, as a nation, think about changing the inequality that is before us in this nation? So um, as you'll see, I, I try to take on both of those. There is, no one in this room I think will be surprised to hear, a long-term trend of rising inequality in the United States. It started in the mid-1970s, so we're you know, 30 years into this. That rising trend followed more than 50 years of declining inequality. And in fact, it was that whole period of declining inequality in the United States and in a whole variety of other developed nations which led to the development of what is called the Kuznets Hypothesis, which essentially said over the development process, there's an initial period when inequality rises and a following period when inequality falls. And I think what we have shown over the last several decades, not just in this country, but in a number of countries, that the Kuznets Hypothesis is incomplete and that in developed countries, inequality can rise as well as fall. And I want to come back at, towards the end of this lecture to talk about sort of fleshing out the, um, you know, how to think in a somewhat more nuanced way about trends in inequality in more developed countries. Um, why do we care about inequality? Um, I, again, many people in this room can answer this question as well or better than I. Um, some number of people might think that economic, inequality, uh, economic equality is a goal in and of itself. And you often hear this argued in a European perspective. Um, you very rarely hear it argued in a US perspective. Um, US, um, uh, when you ask these sorts of questions in uh, public opinion polls, nobody thinks economic equality is a goal in and of itself in the United States. But quite a few do in some European countries. Um, you might think of economic inequality, um, if it comes along with declining well-being at the bottom, is a problem simply because of what's happening at the bottom, i.e., we may not care about the top, but if this signals the fact that the poor are becoming poorer, um, that may be a problem. Um, Rising inequality may lead to reduced economic mobility. You could imagine that um, social class and stratification becomes more set in a period of rising inequality. It's harder to get from the bottom to the top. Um, and that certain groups in particular that are disproportionately located at the bottom, racial and ethnic minorities, single mother families, um, become um, that the persons in those families um, be, make, ha, just have a great deal more difficulty reaching the middle class, much less getting any further up, up, up the scale. And you may think that um, economic inequality affects overall aggregate economic growth. There's a very substantial literature on inequality in developing nations. There's much less of a literature on inequality in the developed world. But this is argued both ways. Milton Friedman has argued quite strongly that um, inequality and potentially rising inequality creates incentives for people to work harder because you can get richer. Um, and others argue just the opposite. There's a reasonably recent book by Richard Freeman where he um, cites a variety of lab experiments which suggest as the rewards get further and further apart, the people at the bottom try less and less because they simply think they're not going to get very far. Okay, so you know, we can figure out what, what we think those effects are. And then you might think there are all sorts of other social effects that go beyond economics. Um, there is evidence, for instance, of increasing inequality in citizenship participation in the United States. And um, you might think that inequality limits civic conversation. You've got groups that simply have very different economic realities. And it's harder to talk about policies that bring them both in. So you know, there might be all sorts of reasons you know, why we care about inequality. And I'm going to take it as a given that we do beyond on this slide and move on. Um, so this paper is going to do three things. Um, for those of you who want numbers, the first part is all about numbers. I want to look about at rising inequality um, across all of the income components and provide what I think is a more comprehensive exploration of what is changing in terms of inequality in this country than exists out there at the moment. There's an enormous literature on wages. There's a limited literature on families and married couples. And I want to sort of bring this all together. Um, if you don't like numbers, you can snooze through the first part, and I'll wake you up for the second part, because at that point I want to talk about um, how is it that economic shocks 
may or may not cause changes in long-term trends in inequality. And the obvious motivation here might be, well, gosh, we happen to be in the deepest recession since 1929 in terms of wealth destruction and you know, rising unemployment. Um, is it possible this could change the trend in inequality? So I, I want to think about the framework by which economic shocks may affect inequality. And then in the last part, I'll come back and ask, what would be the circumstances under which a deep economic recession, such as we're currently experiencing, um, may or may not um, lead to a change in this 30-year trend of rising inequality? So that's where I'm going, all right? And um, any of you who want details, go read the paper. <laughs> I, I'm going to take sort of a quick look over the top of this, and I'm not going to deal with a lot of the technical and measurement issues, which are very, very important to convincing any scholar that I've done this right or not. And you can hear more about that, I suspect, tomorrow in, the, in, in that discussion. Um, so part one, changes in the level and distribution of inequality. And again, I, there, there's a large number of sites here that are in the paper. Um, there's an extensive literature on wages. Um, there is less literature on earnings and the way in which wages, weeks, and hours of work interact in terms of earnings inequality. And then there's an even smaller literature that steps from earnings up to total income inequality and its components. And to the extent that literature is out there, it either focuses on married couples or it focuses on families and almost never looks at single individuals. And I would want to take a more comprehensive look in this first part about how inequality is changing. So my data, quickly, is on um, the March Current Population Survey. Um, this is, I'm going to look, show you data for 1979 and 2007. These are somewhat similar years in the business cycle. They're the end of um, expansions right before we hit, we sort of fall off the cliff into recessions. Um, there's some differences with them. Obviously, 79 was much higher inflation. I'm going to look at non-elderly adults. Um, and I'm looking at 18, 64-year-olds, and I'm particularly doing this because a lot of my interest here is centered around the ways in which wage inequality are or are not translating into larger income inequality. And so that's why I'm leaving the elderly out of this, since they are largely not in the labor force. But the perspective here is how people as individuals looking out there view themselves or see themselves relative to others. All right. Um, this includes all people living alone or in families. I'm going to call these family units because families in the federal data always means people who live with other relatives. And yes, I've got people who live with other relatives, but I've also got a lot of singles. And um, I, I, so a family unit could be either a single person, a married couple family and everyone who lives with them, or a single-headed family and everyone who lives with them. And there's a long discussion, or at least some discussion in the paper about how I adjust for top coding. The good news here is actually it's very easy to, um, a, a, a lot of these data um, have different top codes in different years. People only report the data up to a certain point. And if you're looking at inequality, you actually care about what's happening up there. And there's a couple of papers in the last few years that have gone in depth into some of the non-public CPS data and given us very detailed information on how to handle top coding by income component by year in the CPS. And, and I'm using that, and I think I have, uh, you know, as a result of that, a reasonably decent adjustment for top coding. Um, so when I say I'm going to look at people, I'm going to look at people's per capita income. And I define per capita income for individual I as the income of the family in which I lives. Again, the family is all related people who live together, divided by the square root of the number of people in the family. Why am I dividing by the square root rather than just the number of people in the family? Because we think that family size actually affects well-being. And you know, two can live a little more cheaply than one. Three can live a little more cheaply than two. So you need to take account of what economists call family equivalence as family size changes. And um, this is a relatively convenient way to make that adjustment. It's a way. Uh, it's an adjustment that many, many people use. Um, I have not gone back yet. It's one of the robustness checks I want to do is to try a couple of other equivalent scales. But I don't think I'm going to find anything that um, varies a whole lot but on that measure. So. Before I turn to looking at per capita income, let me start by just looking only at workers. Okay, So I'm now going to look at um, wages and hours and weeks of work among workers only, because this is such an important subcomponent to total family income that we're going to take this, um, uh, this, this sidetrack for a minute. And earnings, personal earnings, are hourly wages times hours of work times weeks of work. Okay, That's W times H times K in my methodology here. And I'm going to look at 1979 and 2007, and I should warn you that because labor force participation among both men and women has changed, fallen among men, risen quite dramatically among women, 
That means that earnings changes between these two years are both changes in labor market opportunities over this time period, but also changes in who's working and who's not working. And I, I will come back to those differences um, as I go through this analysis, all right? So um, earnings inequality rises. That shouldn't surprise anyone here. But so does the median of the distribution. And here I have a couple of the sort of statistics that are in this part of the paper. Um, I think I've got, yeah, I don't know if you guys can see this, a laser pointer here, 79, 2007. This is all in 2007 dollars, OK? So I'm looking at earnings among workers only. Um, so median earnings, median is the person, if you line everyone up from the lowest earner to the highest earner, and I have no non-workers in this analysis right now, um, the person who sits right in the middle is the median. Um, so the median worker in 79 earned 25, where's my point to go to, earned 25,000 dollars. The median uh, person in 2007 earned 31,000. So there's a very substantial upward shift in the distribution. And an upward shift in the distribution with no change in its shape, of course, makes everyone better off, right? But the shape changes as well. Um, the Gini coefficient, which I'm not really going to explain, is it goes up, it means rising inequality. It's a standard measure of inequality. Also look at coefficient of variation all the way through the paper. Um, both of these show rises in inequality, not huge. Um, there's an increase in the 90-50 ratio. This is the person at the 90th point in that distribution compared to the median. And um, I can tell you, you, know, you, you don't know by looking at this whether it's the 90th going up or um, the 50th going up. And I can tell you all of these changes are the 90th percentile going up relative to the median. And as you can see, inequality at the top has widened. Um, but inequality at the bottom has actually gone down. And what's happened here, as we will see in a minute, is the tenth percentage of the distribution has moved up. And that's related to this increase overall in the median as well. So there's a rise in inequality in total earnings. This is total annual earnings. It's not wages. It's not hourly wages. And it's relatively mild compared to what we think has happened to wage inequality. And I'll come back and talk about this. Here's what the graph looks like. And I'll show you a number of these graphs. Each of these bins. Each of these spins is um, $5,000, OK? So I show you how many people there are in each of these $5,000 bins as you go up. And then I hit a point where it just breaks. And this is everyone who makes more than $150,000, right? Um, the white bars, the, the sort of the empty black squares are 1979. The gray bars are 2007. So what you see here is this distribution has definitely shifted up. Big increase at the top. You can see the widening of inequality on this end. But there's also a substantial decline in the number of people here at the bottom. Where's my, there, where's it going? There, there we go. Um, particularly the number of people in these very bottom bins, OK? And um, these changes uh, are primarily due to what's happening among women, OK? What is happening among women is there are many, many fewer women in those low earnings bins, um, largely because of increases in hours. That's you know, what we're going to see here is a whole hours story laid on top of what's happening with wages. So here are the same statistics for women and for men. You see much lower earnings, average earnings among women. This is, again, annual earnings. Um, they go from 16,000 to 26,000, very, very large percentage increase. You see only a very small increase in annual earnings among men. It's the women where all the changes are occurring. Um, rising inequality among both groups, bigger rises in inequality with the men. Um, rising uh, 90th to 50th ratios, the top is pulling away for both of these groups. And for both of these groups, the 50-10 ratio is falling. And the 10th percentile for both of them is actually, just as we saw with total inequality, catching up. And let me show you for each of these groups. Here's men. Um, for men, you know, what basically is happening is this whole distribution is flattening, right? Um, you see fewer people in the middle. You see a few more here. You see fewer at the bottom. A much longer upper tail, a lot more guys up here. And you know, you've got greater inequality, just a much flatter distribution overall. <laughs> For women, you see unambiguous upward shift in the whole distribution. Many, many fewer women here in these very low earnings bins. Where'd my, where'd it go to? There it is. Many fewer women here in the low earnings bins, and lots more women up here, both in the middle and, and, and up towards the top. Um, so widening inequality for women, but around a big upward shift in the median. I mean, among women, you could pretty unambiguously say that um, people at the same point in the distribution in 1997 are better off than they were at that point in the distribution. Um, you know, um, back in 1979. 
So one question may be, well, you aren't showing, you know, you're showing some rises in inequality, you're showing these big declines in low earnings. Is this at all, cons is your data screwy? Is this consistent with what we think we know about wage inequality? Because what we think we know about wage inequality is that wages for lower wage workers, particularly men, actually fell. Um, and I'm not showing a lot of falling wages or falling earnings. So let me now look at wages and try to persuade you that I show exactly the same patterns in wage inequality as everyone else's data. But you know, when you combine all this together, you get a slightly different pattern for total earnings. So inequality for wages grows much more strongly than inequality in annual earnings. And obviously, the difference between these are the hours and weeks of work. Um, and inequality by skill level looks just as we expect. But I've come back to this. The less skilled are a shrinking share of the population. So here's what happens by wages for, for these five different skill groups. The top is men. The bottom is women. And, and this is what everyone has been saying is happening to wages all along. Men is bad news. Um, you know, this is all around the zero point. Um, how much is this falling? And what you see is people with less than a high school degree have lost 20% in wages since 1979. Exactly high school loses about 10%. Um, some college is essentially flat. And it's not until you get to college degrees or more than college degrees that any men show gains in their wages. You know, a real widening of the distribution with unambiguously worse off wages among those who are least skilled. Women, um, the bottom hasn't grown much, but you don't see the negatives for women at the bottom. And for every other group, you see stepping up bigger and big increases in, um, in earnings. So, so these are the same patterns that all of the data that looks at um, wages by skill level are showing. Now let's turn these into um, wage distributions. So here's the, it's not the earnings distribution, this is the hourly wage distribution. Here's the hourly wage distribution for men. And um, as you can see here, there's, you know, there's sort of an increase, but you know, it actually doesn't change all that much. It's a little bit hollowing out of the distribution just above the median and a few more people below that. For women, that's where the big changes are. Um, all of these women who used to be down here in these low earning bins, um, and now each of these bins are actually $2.50 an hour in wages, have moved to hourly wages, so I've got a different bin here, um, have moved out, and many, many more of them are up here in the higher earnings categories. They're just almost we're no, you know, very few women up here, and there, there are a lot more now. Um, so that the, the, the women have, you know, and not surprisingly, um, you actually have real increases in wages among the women, and you can see that as you look at their hourly wages. Among the men, not so much, right? Um, so um, what's missing, if I look at wages and translate from wages into earnings, well, what's missing is what's happening to hours and weeks of work. And it turns out that changes in hours and weeks of work are equalizing while wages are disequalizing. Wages are spreading out. Hours and weeks of work are actually becoming more equal. And it's particularly weeks of work among women that are becoming more, particularly among women. There are fewer women with very low annual hours of work. And it's mainly because there are very few women who have um, very few weeks of work. Hours hasn't changed as much. And so there's been a particularly large increase in annual weeks of work among women. And here's that graph. Um, so this is women in 79 and 2007. Um, used to be a lot more women down here who worked you know, less than half the year. And there are very few now. And a huge increase in the number of women who are working essentially full time. Right? So you've got rising wages and rising hours of work among women. And that's shifting the women's wage distribution upward. And um, that leads to um, what am I getting to here? Sort of the conclusion of what's going on. Um, why is inequality in earnings rising less than wages? Well, there are three reasons. One is that hourly wage inequality has increased and increased markedly, but in part it's being offset by declines in inequality in annual hours worked. That's reason number one. Reason number two, while wages among the less educated are falling among men and flat among women, the less educated are becoming a smaller share of the total labor force. Um, so that that effect um, you know, is, is somewhat offset by the shrinking population share of this group. Thirdly, um, median increases in wages, hours, and weeks among women, you know, as women become a larger part of the labor force and women's distribution is shifting up, that has changed the you know, that's, that's, that's changed inequality in the whole distribution. And as women's share of labor force rises, you've got some offset to rising wage inequality as, as this growing group of women, fewer and fewer of whom are working um, very few hours, um, is, is coming into the labor market and adding, um, you know, a sort of, you know, t taking away that sort of bottom end of the distribution. Um, one thing I try to do here is simulate the effects 
of holding labor market behavior at its 1979 levels, and by that I mean holding the distribution of annual hours constant and trying to hold labor force participation constant, and we could all argue about how to do this simulation, I promise you. And, and I should say it's not a, it's, this is a conceptual simulation, not a realistic one. Um, you know, labor force participation is quite endogenous with wages. As wages change, work behavior changes. So to separate these, I don't want to try to suggest you could have had one without the other. You know, both, there are reasons why these two are changing together. But just to look at what was the conceptual effect of changes in labor market behavior by itself, um, take that out and look at what happens if you only have changes in wages. Well, the result is actually declines in the male median earnings level and much wider inequality in men's wages and smaller increases in female median earnings and wider inequality as well. So that um, a lot of what's happening here in terms of increases in median income and um, bringing up the bottom is occurring because of changes in labor market behavior, not because of, um, you know, that th there's offsetting in one form or another the widening wages. And the summary here is, based on annual earnings, equivalent workers, you know, sort of people at the same point in the distribution, the 20th, the 30th, the 40th percentile, are on average doing better in 2007 than 1979. We see rising inequality, but it's rising inequality around a distribution that's shifting upward. That's the good news, because you tend to think that, you know, rising inequality isn't as bad as if everyone's get, getting better off. The bad news is this isn't because wages are growing rapidly for all groups of workers. Wages are growing, but only among the most skilled. The reason you've had um, this big upward shift is, even, is more because of increases in labor force be, uh, behavior, increases in hours of work, and also when, when we move to total income, increases in labor force participation. And that's a very different phenomenon. And then it becomes quite crucial to decide what do you believe about increases in work behavior and whether it makes people better or worse off, um, particularly women's increases in work behavior, as to whether you think overall these shifts show problems or you know, show opportunity. So that's a quick trip through wages. And I now want to go from individual wages to per person income. All right, and talk about the total income distribution looked at from the view of all, all of these non-elderly persons out there. All right. Um, so let's turn to the overall. I mean, here, here is my equation for per person income. I already explained um, everybody's sharing the income among all their families, um, adjusted for differences in family size. And I'm going to you know, divide my family income into three components. Total family earnings. Now, that's not what we were looking at before. Before, we were looking at earnings among individual workers. This is the earnings in the family unit, everyone who works added together. So if the husband works more hours or gains more wages, everyone else in the family benefits. If the wife goes to work, everyone in the family benefits. They're all sharing income. Government income and other income. All right. And I'm actually going to end up not saying very much in this talk about government and other income because there's not as much of a story there. Okay. And again, to remind you, I'm looking at all persons 18 to 64 and their per person income, as I calculate there. And I'm going to break them into three groups as well and see if things are shifting differently among single individuals versus people who are in single family households, single family headed households. Now, that doesn't mean all of these are the heads of households. There are other adults in those households as well. And people who are in married couple family households. And again, about 15% of the adults in those are not part of the married couple. Their children or their other relatives or their parents or their other adults living in the household. Um, as you might expect, there are actually shifts between these groups of um, you know, where people are living over this period of time. So um, the percentage of single people in, uh, the percentage of people living in single person households has gone up. The percentage of people living in single headed family units has gone up, no surprises. And of course, that means the percentage of people living in married couple households has gone down. Um, it is also true that mean family size has fallen. Um, it ha fortunately, it hasn't fallen among single persons. That would be a problem. They're still, they're still size one. Um, but both single-headed families and married couple families are smaller. So that means you're dividing even the same income among smaller people. So that in itself is going to create an increase in per-person income, right? Just right there. And it turns out that about a third of the increase in per-person income is going to be driven by the shift in family size. Um, overall, you see an even bigger shift among all persons because you're shifting to these smaller families, right? So these family, individual family groups are getting smaller, and then there's a shift to the smaller family groups. So um, overall, per person family unit size is falling in the total population. Um, so let's look at the total income distribution for all persons out there, all non-elderly persons. 
Well, it turns out there is a big, you know, you see, you stop me if you've heard this before, there's a big increase in the median. Um, it goes up by almost $7,000 here. Um, this again, 2007, adjusted for inflation dollars. There's an increase in inequality at the same time, and both the 90th percentile is pulling ahead, and um, the 50th percentile is pulling ahead of the 10th. So this is widening inequality throughout the distribution. And this is the way this looks. Again, I, here I've got $5,000 inter intervals again. Um, a much lower number of people in these very low bins, but uh, more people here in the middle and a big increase at the top. And you know, a clear sort of a pulling away of the distribution on both sides. Um, so you know, you, there's, you know, clearly widening inequality in total income. Um, and the summary here is, um, again, those who look at equivalent people in the distribution <laughs> Um, and compared 2007 to 1979, would say people at the you know, equivalent points in the distribution are better off. The sh distribution has shifted upwards. But if you, in, nine, in 2007, are in the bottom half of the distribution, and you're making not a comparison back to 1979, but you're comparing yourself to other people in the current distribution, <laughs> you're going to feel worse off because m the people at the top are pulling away from you. So the question here of are you making um, you know, sort of changes between these two years, or are you making relative changes of where you sit in the distribution compared to everybody else, um, you're going to get a different answer as to whether your well-being is um, higher or lower. And um, I'm sure we'll have a lively discussion tomorrow morning um, with the sociologists and the economists as to whether our comparisons ought to be relative or absolute. Um, and um, you know, it's, 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 a, it's a, a much debated point out there as to how do you measure well-being and what, what does this tell you. Um, by family type, you get um, increases in the medians for all groups, particularly um, very, you know, the lowest income group is single-headed single families, not surprisingly. The majority of these are single mothers. I, I think about 65% of this, you know, the, um, not many of these groups don't have to have kids, but about 65% of this group is single moms with kids. Um, and the rest are either um, male-headed families with kids, there's a small group of that that's growing, or they're single-headed families, but there's no children under the age of 18 in them. Um, you see growing inequality, for every one of these groups, you see growth at the top of the distribution, and you see growth at the bottom, you know, grow at growing inequality at the bottom of the distribution. But they're sitting at quite different points. Um, and so one of the things that's happening here as these lower income families are getting more and more of the population in them, that's pulling the distribution downward. Even if no distributions were changing at all, you'd see some widening inequality because you got more of these low-income groups in the population in 2007 than you did in, 19, in, in, two, uh, than you did in 1979. Okay. Um, so the results suggest that single individuals showed a moderate increase in the median and a moderate increase in inequality. Single-headed family in, in units were lower income but saw quite large median increases, a slightly smaller shift in earnings inequality um, as earnings and work effort increased, particularly among these single moms, consistent with everything we know about what was happening with welfare reform, uh, particularly in the late 1990s. And here are the distributions. This is the distribution for single individuals. Um, um, this is total income. And again, you see just sort of a flattening out of this distribution. Um, you know, it's just you know, more equally spread across the whole range. Um, Here's the distribution for our single-headed family units, and this is quite interesting. This is consistent with a lot of the re research literature on what happens to single moms after 1990 with welfare reform. You see large numbers of people who are better off, whose income goes up, they work more, um, and their increase in earnings more than offsets the decline in welfare benefits, but there's some group of losers out here. And there's a whole literature here on disconnected women, women who post-welfare reform are receiving neither welfare nor working regularly, and who's, uh, who are at very low levels of income. And you can sort of see that, that spreading apart here in the distribution. And then we come to married couples. And let me just say an extra word about them, because married couples are interesting. Um, and they're interesting because um, you know, marriage is a selective process here. You know, people don't randomly marry each other. And the selectivity in marriage has changed over time. In particularly, um, less skilled people are selecting out of marriage. So married couples are coming over time a little bit more skilled. Um, and there's been a big increase in two earner couples, and that increase has not been equally spread across the skill distribution. And in particularly, the wives of high earning husbands have shown by far the greatest increases in their income. So this is a chart that um, um, Jin Wee Jun and Kevin Murphy did through the early 1990s in a paper in the Journal of Labor Economics and that I've updated through 2007. What I have here is 
the decile, the you know, the bottom 10% of men, this, uh, by men's earnings, the bottom 10% of husbands, the next 20%, the median group of husbands, the top 10%, and I show you women, the wives' earnings in each of those income deciles. So in 1979, the wives of the top earnings husbands actually earned less than the wives of the middle earning husbands. By 2007, you see very sharp increases here. So the big earning wives are married to the big earning guys, right? And um, of course, that means you're really pulling inequality up among married couples as the selectivity issue. So who's really gained um, from, um, in, in the labor market from decreasing discrimination and the opening up of a whole set of occupations to women? Well, it's highly skilled women who are now working full time in all of these professional jobs. And you know, they, they are, because of marital selectivity, married to high skilled guys. And so this group is sort of pulling away. Um, this is the distribution of married couples. You see a huge decline in the number of really low earning married couples and big increases up here in the top. Okay. Um, oh, oh, yep, that's right. So what is driving changes in total income inequality? Well, family, in, f family composition, just the shifts between single individuals and single headed families and married couple families explains about 15% of rising inequality if you sort of simulate what if, what if composition hadn't changed. I then do a simulation that says, what if you held earnings constant? What if you let everything else change but said there was no increase in inequality in earnings, all right? So everything else is changing. And well, it turns out that that in and of itself explains about 35%. And actually, if you take account of some of the interactions between earnings and government income and other income sources, it explains even more. And this is, you know, it's the earnings inequality that's driving most of this is the bottom line. And the changes in government and other income are, are relatively less important by themselves. Um, so what's the summary here? Rising in income inequality is occurring um, due to rising earnings inequality almost entirely as well as some shifts in composition of, of what type of families people are living in. But those effects are somewhat muted by the fact that you've also got this big upward shift in the median and the whole distribution is largely shifting upward um, by $7,000 per person on average among all of these non-elderly persons. About 35% of this rise, I referred to this earlier, is due purely to declining family size, that people in smaller families at the same income level are better off. Um, and you know, they've got to take that into account. Um, but the rest of this is um, all about um, increases in work behavior, particularly among women, among wives, and among single female heads. So the question, are families better or worse off, again, depends very heavily on your view of work hours and market work, especially among women. I would venture to say, stepping well outside of my data, that the higher income families where the women are choosing a different set of professions and very different hours choices than they did in the past are probably, I would be willing to say, better off. It is much less clear you can say that about the lower income families where a lot of these income increases by the women are offsetting declines in male wages and are reflecting um, changes in family composition so the women are the only earners in the family and they're no longer married. And I think it's much more ambiguous to say that those sorts of changes at the bottom end of the distribution um, are actually leaving people better off. Um, so again, how you view the labor market changes are quite key to how you interpret the overall well-being implications of these inequality shifts that go along with big shifts upward in median income. All right. That's the quantitative part of the paper, and I've, I've got exactly where I want to be, which is to, the, um, to, to sort of step back and say, those of you who don't want numbers, that I've walked you through a whole lot of numbers and pictures and graphs, and now let's, let's talk about um, um, sort of bigger picture issues. Um, and um, you know, I want to talk about um, plagues and wars and recessions and um, you know, all sorts of uh, interesting topics here. right? So the question is, we've been in a 30-year period of rising inequality. Um, you know, what, what is going to change that? You know, if we think that we don't like rising inequality, and I know there are a good number of people in the room who would claim that, I suspect not everyone, um, you know, what, what are the factors that actually over time shift the trends in inequality? And it turns out that there's almost no research on this. And um, what I'm going to show you here is not really research so much as it is speculation, trying to read the research literature and say, well, what does it suggest to us about this? And I'm going to particularly look at the impact of economic shocks. 
where economic shocks I define as you know, political, economic, technological changes that alter the economic constraints that are facing a nation. And I'm going to look at two types of economic shocks. I'm going to look at catastrophic events which I define as a shock that occurs within a defined time period. You can often date these things. And this is a war. It's a deep recession. It's a natural disaster. It's a pandemic illness that sweeps through the population. All right? It's a catastrophic event. And then I'm going to look at economic shocks that instead unfold over time. Technological change, the opening up of new frontiers, climate change, demographic shifts, changes in institutions or in policies that change skill levels, um, you know, ver thing things like that. And, and, and talk about sort of these type of economic shocks and say, what do we think we can say, if anything, about how economic shocks may affect long-term trends in income inequality? So um, an economic shock is going to change economic constraints by, you know, I'm a good economist, by changing three things. It's going to change human capital, physical capital, land, or resource constraints. And everyone who said Econ 101 should not be surprised by that list. Um, human capital here is both population changes. You know, war or disease could actually substantially reduce a population. Um, changes in fertility techniques could increase it or reduce it. Or it could be changes in skill levels for the existing population. Physical capital as well could be changes in the pure amount of physical capital. I mean, we've just seen in the last year huge wealth destruction. You know, war does wealth destruction in another form. Um, but it could also be the type of, of physical capital through technology, that there's suddenly a whole bunch of new ways to produce things because of new technologies. Or it could be land or resource constraints. Um, wars regularly shift boundaries. Technologies create new ways, you know, you know, land that was useless suddenly could be farmed or suddenly has mineral wealth in it because you could extract the minerals that you couldn't extract before. So that you also see, you know, real, real shifts, even, even if the economists always said, well, land is fixed. Well, it's really not, um, you know, if you talk about nation states and or if you talk about technological changes. And this is going to be very important in this whole story. These changes, of course, interact with the political economy and with the policy choices. And my emphasis throughout this is not on the developing world but on the developed world, and particularly in the developed world, where there is a, um, you know, effectively functioning government that actually, you know, has outreach and can implement policies, um, the role of policy and the role of institutional change um, becomes quite important in exactly what the effect of these economic shocks is. Okay. So let me start with the catastrophic events. And I, I must say, it was, it was actually incredibly interesting to look up some of this literature, of which I sort of was vaguely familiar with pieces of it, but you know, hadn't tried to sit down and put it together. So, so um, um, I, let me I, actually, you know, so, so I reviewed the evidence of the effects on inequality of war, pandemic disease, and deep economic recession, right? And there are other catastrophic shocks you could think about, but that's, that's what I looked at. Um, and I should note that, um, uh, you know, I, I, there, there's sometimes a sort of a feeling, well, in the developed countries, we don't have to worry about this sort of stuff. And um, I, I think that that is an optimistic view of life. Um, you know, clearly, deep economic recession, we might have thought we didn't have to worry about, but events have proved us wrong. Um, if you listen to any of the epidemiologists, there's serious concern about the possibilities of pandemic disease, that is, widespread illness, um, that could actually substantially affect the population sweeping um, through the developed world. And, you know, I don't think we're exactly immune to the effects of war either, even though we've been fortunate enough in much of the developed world to fight our wars a distance away from us as opposed to on our own boundaries. But um, um, so, uh, do, 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 let's not do that. Um, so j just a few comments here. Um, and let me take war as the example. I'm not going to talk you through all of the conversation in the paper. Um, so war obviously could, in the very short run, destroy both human and physical capital, right? And um, you know what that effect on inequality is. You know is probably to narrow inequality in the short run. I mean, destructions of wealth tend to disproportionately bring the top down. And destructions of human capital, if you look at where casualties come from and who fights wars, almost inevitably decimates lower income populations. Both um, um, military populations are more likely to be lower income, as well as civilian populations who, who die as the result of war are more likely to be low income. So you know, you're sort of taking that group of the population out disproportionately. You're destroying the wealth at the top. And you know, the short-term effect of the war is narrowing income distribution. World War II, um, um, certainly in terms of wealth destruction, was one of the main forces that started started a long-term trend towards narrowing inequality throughout Europe and the United States. And there's some, some wonderful papers sort of showing, um, you know, wonderful papers showing wealth destruction in World War II. Um, and you know, it, it's really dramatic. 
you know, it, you know, it, it, and you know, even though this war wasn't fought on U.S. soil, I mean, you know, given wealth is held globally, particularly by richer individuals, you know, the fact that it was fought in Europe and huge amounts of wealth in Europe was destroyed meant that wealth um, holdings in the United States for you know U U.S. people who held wealth saw huge wealth destruction as well. Um, you know, at the same time, however, um, the long-term effects are much, much harder to talk about. So um, once this wealth is destroyed and the war is over, there are all sorts of opportunities for nation building. And that creates wealth building opportunities. The war itself may have opened up all sorts of new political opportunities. It may have released constraints of social class and social stratification so that new groups have opportunities to build wealth that they didn't have before. Um, and you can see post-war, you know, post you know, sort of who's rich and who's poor shifts around in a lot of situations. Um, similarly, war has both different long-term and short-run effects on human capital. The short-run effects, you know, well, if you think it's death and disproportionate death among lower income and, and poorer populations, that's, um, um, I guess, equality enhancing, maybe not the way you want to do it. Um, if you think, however, the effect is disease and um, um, maiming, um, there's actually a number of studies showing that the veterans of wars um, in a number of, you know, the Civil War, there's evidence on this, and there's um, actually some evidence coming out of World War I in Europe as well, that people who served in those wars where there was, you know, a substantial number of people who were seriously maimed and hurt um, earned lower incomes in the long term um, after those wars, um, so that you might create a lower income group in the population as a result of the war that's around for many years thereafter, since wars tend to be fought by young men. Um, on the other hand, in the long run, you also have other things that happen. The US following World War II, in part because we felt we owed this um, to our soldiers, created the GI Bill. And there is very good evidence that the GI Bill was one of the other factors that worked towards long-term declines in income inequality in the United States by raising human capital skills widely among men who served in the military. And that increase in human capital skills brought up the bottom and, and, you know, um, within the United States and, 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 and you know, again, lowered inequality quality and created some long-term trend there. So, you know, what the, the political economy that wars create in terms of both the political economy and in the, in the markets that are out there and, and who gains the wealth and who takes advantage of the nation rebuilding that occurs and the political economy in terms of human capital and, and what the nation does to rebuild its human capital and or reward those people who fought are, are quite important here. Um, now, interestingly enough, deep economic recession ends up having far less effect. If you look at 1929 in the United States, you actually see um, an, a, a wealth decline among the top 1% of the population. And Emmanuel Saiz, who's here at Berkeley, and Tom Piketty, who's out of France, have written a really several nice papers on um, wealth changes in the very top 10% of the US distribution over the um, 20th century. And what they show is that the wealth declines were almost entirely in 1920 time limited 1929 limited the very top 1% of the population. Um, and of course, that says something about how widely stock market wealth was held at that point in time. You might think that the wealth destruction right now is affecting people more broadly. Um, but it turns out that neither the 1930s recession nor the early 1980s recession, which are the two recent quite deep recessions, and the 30s is worse by orders of magnitude, um, don't really have very big effects on economic inequality. That the trends that are underway precede those recessions. They don't accelerate through the recession. They they just sort of continue on. And in the 30s, you've got a, a, a trend that starts in the early 20s towards declining inequality. It just continues on without a lot of change. In fact, if anything, um, you know, it, you know, the big changes are a little bit in 1929 and then a big change in World War II and then some stuff after that. In the 80s, you really see nothing. I mean, the, the increasing inequality starts in the 70s, and that recession seems to have very little effect. And one thing I haven't done yet is tried to go look up um, some evidence from some other countries. And I just haven't done all of my homework yet on this one. But um, I have difficulty finding um, big shifts and trends that come about from deep economic recessions, at least based on US experience. So conclusions on you know, the effects of catastrophic shocks on trends in income inequality. Well, in the first, you know, the effects on inequality can go either way. And the short run and the long run effects could actually be different. Um, so as I've noted, you could open up new wealth creation opportunities in the long run and shift social class and social mobility as well. Um, you could lead to changes in political thinking. I mean, wars often lead to revolutions and whole new governments, right? Um, that changes the policy options that are out there. And you often may have long-term population repercussions, particularly through health, um, because of these catastrophic shocks. What's most important here to emphasize is that catastrophic shocks, while um, 
you know, in some cases, natural disasters, you might think you, they're not entirely avoidable. I think that's the wrong way to view this in the developed world, that catastrophic shocks don't just happen. And the effectiveness of diplomacy, the effectiveness of the public health system, the effectiveness of the barriers outside of New Orleans or outside of the Netherlands for natural disasters or our tornado warning systems or our hurricane warning systems, or the effectiveness of monetary and fiscal policy are actually quite important to what is a catastrophic shock, when does it hit, and how deep and how catastrophic is it. So, so the very, you know, the whole set of political institutions here matter deeply for whether you even have something that turns into a catastrophic shock. And, you know, for that I will reference you to all the recent literature about, you know, did we really need to go into the current recession that we're in or not? Could we have avoided this with a different set of regulatory policies? And, you know, a topic that would be much debated for long periods of time. Okay. Second type of economic shocks. Economic shocks that unfold over time. And this is less, uh, this, these are not datable in quite the same way. And these are often not a single event, they're a process. They're a series of events that follow each other, all right, and often feed on each other. So um, I look at sort of what do we know about technological change and its effect on inequality? What do we know about changes in skills and human capital? Um, and particularly the expansion of things like public schools or public universities? Um, or what do we know about the opening up of new frontiers? Okay, and um, again, let me just give, sort of give a few examples here. Um, as you might expect, these sorts of things, whether it's expanded skills or changes in technology or changes in new frontiers, again, create opportunities for wealth creation. And what happens with these opportunities depends a great deal on um, the policies that are in place as the wealth opportunity expands. So for instance, if your new frontier is very tightly controlled by you know, you know, who gets the land and who gets the wealth from the land and who goes out there, is it controlled by royal charter or is it a homestead act that sends large numbers of people out and gives them land who never had land before, you can have very different effects on long-term equality. So there's a fascinating article that's just out comparing the opening up of the frontier in the United States with the opening up of the frontier in Latin America. You know, both of these have very large huge frontiers, and there's this theory that says the new frontiers in the U.S. are what created democracy and enhanced equality in this country. Well, in that case, why didn't that happen in Latin America? And the argument is it's all about the political institutions. You know, Latin America didn't homestead. Latin America had a small group of elite who basically controlled the wealth that came off the frontier, handed out the land to their friends with large wealth holdings, which was a very different process of opening up a frontier than what happened in the United States, where there's actually a very nice recent article that shows that people who moved to the upper middle West in homesteaded were disproportionately um, folks who had um, lower earnings and income on the East Coast. And, um, and, and they try to do some form of, it's hard to do with the data, you know, some form of actually, um, you know, proportional matching, trying to find equivalent people and, you know, some who moved and some who didn't, and it's hard to do with old data. But I mean, their claim is that, you know, this, this was not just rich people moving and homesteading and getting richer, but it was actually landless and low income and um, um, landless and and non-homeowning laborers who moved out and became homeowners and landowners um, and, and, and argued that this, you know, this, this was wealth creation at the same time it was um, equality enhancing. So the policy changes in interact in all sorts of ways with this. And you think of the same thing in terms of skills and human capital. Imagine a world where you build new universities. And in one world, you use those universities to make them publicly available and subsidized to anyone who can come, right? And in another world, you essentially make them available to the children of the elite. Um, you know, that's going to lead to two very different processes about the ways in which skill enhancement here are going to feed into long-term inequality. Um, and you can compare, for instance, you know, I think historically the university system in France with the creation of public universities in, in the United States is one comparison there. So um, the effects of these unfolding economic shocks, again, they can increase or decrease inequality depending on how they shift wealth creation opportunities. The political economy is quite crucial to these effects. The short run and the long run effects may differ as well. Um, and these shocks may in turn change political economy in ways that reinforce or alter. So say that, um, you know, I use it to, to repeat an example, public schooling um, opens up opportunities to historically disadvantaged groups who take the advantage of this to gain additional skills, to get into more powerful positions, who in turn um, 
foster further opening up of schools um, for their children and for their relatives and their friends and people of other ethnic groups and backgrounds. You know, that's a process by which you know, the, the, the process is reinforcing and equalizing. You can think of the other world in which a new university becomes available to social elites who take, you know, who, who then who become in power, whose children go to the university. And you, know, you have a system where you know, if you don't go to the school, um, you, know, you don't get into government positions, and this school is only open to people at a certain income level with a certain type of preparation. And um, so you know, the, the way the political economy is set up can reinforce um, these trends and, and maintain them over time and, and create these long-term trends towards rising or declining inequality. So you know, that said, um, you know, will current rising inequality continue? And the answer is, it depends. It depends on the sorts of things I've been talking about. The answer is yes, if. Um, you think ongoing technological change will continue to be skill biased. And there's quite a bit of evidence that suggests the main thing that's happening out here in terms of all of these wage patterns is that the demand for highly skilled workers has been increasing faster than the supply. And this is due to a whole variety of technologies, many of them computer oriented, which have enhanced the, the value in the economy to highly skilled workers. So that's pulling up those wages. If you think that process has not played itself out yet, and I must say I think there's quite a bit of evidence that it has it will, you know, it, it will then continue, and we will continue to see widening inequality in wages, which will feed through to inequality and all these other components of income. Um, if you think the growing international competition is further going to affect skill bias demand, so far the economists who tried to look at the ways in which trade have widened wages have not found many effects. But I mean, there are some coherent arguments. A very nice article by Paul Krugman in a recent Brookings paper of economic inequality, uh, Brookings papers on e econ economy, um, that um, suggests that the rise of China and India in the last 10 years actually potentially are having much bigger effects on US inequality and skill bias demand than they were um, in the 1980s or the 1990s. Um, one change, of course, is these very steep wealth losses. And this is not really the way we wanted to um, create equality in the um, economy. But um, if you think you're looking at you know, large numbers of years before we get back to where the Dow was um, you know, only a year and a half ago, and that many people are really going to take long-term hits to their wealth, well, you know, that, given the, that you know, it's the top third of people who now actually have wealth holdings, not just the top 1% out there, that is going to have an um, equality-enhancing effect. Um, if you believe that the current outcry over executive salaries, which has become such a symbol um, in the banking industry of, you know, what's wrong with the banking industry, these guys paying billion dollars bonuses, well, if they're going to take public money, we're going to bring down those bonuses and, you know, gasp, they could only make a half million dollars a year. If you think that's a symbolic issue that actually could change behavior over time, not just in the banking industry, but given tight economic times and lower profits and shaking out throughout industries, you might see, uh, you know, a, a substantial decline in you know, these sort of CEO pay relative to you know, common labor pay. And you know, one can tell a story, given what we're observing right now, by which there actually is a shift and that, that top part of the distribution comes down, not just because of wealth declines, but also because of some greater equality in wages between the top and the bottom. If you think high-end sustained unemployment is going to shift the political environment, um, towards greater redistribution, um, then you, you know, so, so that we might be willing to um, not only in the next year or two provide higher unemployment benefits or higher food stamp benefits or do more for lower income families, but there might be some sea change effect here that we will put some things in place in the longer term, such as health insurance for the uninsured or, you know, or, you know, you to take your pick of what we're talking about, um, that could produce a change. And it's quite possible, you know, if this was the least likely on my list, but you know, as we look out to the long-term aging and the problems and the, the rising debt levels in, in this country, you could have, maybe it's not a demand, but at least an acceptance um, of higher taxes. And higher taxes, which will tend to be somewhat redistributionary, um, also um, could change trends. And you know, I, I have to say, I think the current economic environment is one where even if these things are not um, um, you know, or, 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 or maybe less likely than the continuation of the status quo, they're not impossible. If I were giving this talk five years ago, I would have, you know, you, know, you tell me when this is going to happen. It actually could happen. And I think watching these trends and saying, does it happen, is of interest. So, final slide here. In a developed country, 
Long-term inequality doesn't just happen. And if I leave you with any message out of this second part of the talk, this is the message, that the effects of economic shocks in a developed country, which again has effectively functioning institutions and policies, are very much determined by how and when they happen and how the policy environment responds. There is nothing that mandates the effects of any of these shocks in the long run are going to be rising or lowering inequality. You can tell stories by which any of these shocks produce either of those effects. And the question is, what are the institutions that surround those shocks and that direct the way in which they play out in the economy? What that suggests is that we as a nation are making real choices that in turn are going to affect the long-term growth and inequality. And I'll stop there. We have about 20 minutes for questions. There is actually a question card in your program. If you'd like to fill that out, there are people who could pick them up. But uh, so this is our attempt to be classy like the Commonwealth Club. Yeah. But maybe it's not working, so maybe we'll have to get some hands. Uh, the, the only time we did questions was when you thought you had a really controversial speaker, and you didn't want the crazies to stand up and give speeches. We're, we're yeah. worried about the crazies. I mean, I, I can see some of them here, yes, absolutely. But if you've got a question card, yeah, I see some. So why don't you get those? But let me just start with a yeah. question. I haven't heard you say anything about demographic changes, and then related to that, the fact that in sort of modern state mm -hmm. political economies, mm -hmm. health care costs are driving out a lot of other kinds of expenditures, such as K through 12 education, and might I say even expenditures for higher education, mm -hmm. which are things which might have helped to yeah. uh, create human yeah. capital and redistribution. So demographic yeah. plus those kinds yeah. of things, are those important factors? Yeah, so I mean, I, I do mention demographics and sort of these, sh these economic shocks that unfold over time. I don't talk about them too much, but there's no question that you know, aging, long-term aging, or long-term youth youthening, whatever the right term is in the population. What is the right term? Um, Non-aging, um, you know, th th those things can have effects, and um, you know, fertility shifts in technology. Um, <coughs> where there's actually a little bit of evidence of this affecting, um, you know, certain certain groups in the population. So, uh, you know, demographics definitely belong in this list. I think there's no question we can talk about what, you know, what effects they might have. And on a, one of the reasons why you might believe, you know, and let me go back to this slide. Um, why a demand for higher taxes is that people are going to accept that we have to do more to support an aging population. And I think that's the main story behind this particular hypothesis, is why would people accept higher taxes? It's because of the aging of the population. Okay. Healthcare costs, I mean, healthcare costs are a very particular story to the United States, because of course, in most European countries, um, they're handled in a different way, which is not to say they don't have real public costs, but because you've got nationally provided insurance, they don't have the same inequality type effects. Um, it, I, I, that's a complicated answer, and I don't, I don't want to slough it off, but um, you know, it's an interesting question about the extent to which changes in healthcare costs are driving some of these wage shifts. Um, you know, uh, you know the, the problem is the people who get the highest wages and, and the, the best health care, of course, are also the people whose wages have been rising the fastest. So you know, at least on the first face of it, it's not expanded health care that's you know, holding you know, prices down. The, the people with the best deals are also getting the best wages. It's good jobs are good jobs. They're good jobs in terms of wages. They're good jobs in terms of um, other things. You might actually think the inequality trends would look even greater um, if you hadn't had the health costs going on top of, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, on top of the um, wage trends. Because you, you think that actually wages are a little bit lower because we're paying so much more in health costs. Well, this leads into one yeah. of the questions here. Yeah. Your formula for earnings does not include employer-provided <coughs> benefits, mm -hmm. pensions, mm -hmm. uh, health care, yeah. and so forth. With those benefits included, does the median income actually fall from 1979 to 2007, or does this story change in some way yeah. in, in terms no, of It is a great saying? question. And I mean, the short answer is um, we don't have great data on the non-wage compensation. Um, we can guess at it in aggregate. It's a little, you know, and you can make even more tentative guesses at it in um, distributionally, but we have very little distributional. Um, you, you do have to guess um, to do that. Um, I don't think that's going to up offset these trends. If anything, in fact, it's going to um, widen them in some ways, because over this period, low-wage workers have become even less likely to be covered by health insurance, and high-wage workers haven't become more likely, but the value of their health insurance has grown over time. So, and, and health insurance is the biggest issue here that's changing. Um, other forms of non-wage compensation, have, they've actually grown throughout the economy. I mean, everyone actually gets a few more vacation days and a few, you know, the, and other, but, so I, I'm not sure that that's in, equalizing or unequalizing, but I think the healthcare costs would only emphasize um, the growing inequality. It, it wouldn't change any of these trends. Uh, another question. 
Uh, what policy initiatives do you find particularly promising right now? Uh, for example, things that the Obama administration is doing, and whatever. Yeah, so, um, you know, we've done a number of things right in the recent past. And one thing that I think we did very right uh, a decade ago was the implementation of something called the Earned Income Tax Credit, which many of you know exactly what that is. It's, it's basically the largest anti-poverty cash program we have in this country right now. And um, for low-wage workers, it supplements their wages through the tax system if they are in low-income families, all right? Um, and um, you know, that's done a lot to help um, lower income uh, workers, and particularly these single moms as they've left welfare and gone to work, um, have more income than they would have otherwise. Um, I think one of the things I find most promising, what I would certainly do first on this front if I were Mr. Obama, and he's spoken in favor of this, but there's a lot else on his mind right now and he hasn't said too much about it since he became president, um, is I would um, expand the earned income tax credit. Right now, the big dollars of earned income tax credit goes to families with children. And um, they don't, you know, if you're a single individual or a married couple without kids, you don't get this. It's particularly important for the single individuals and it's particularly important for the single guys whose labor force participation is declining. Many of these single guys are dads. They just aren't resident dads. And I care as much about getting them into mainstream employment and working steadily over the year as I care about the mothers of those children because they share income and the dads have some responsibility for those kids. It's going to be much easier to enforce those responsibilities if the dads have incentives to go to work that are as strong as the mothers. Um, so one of the first things I would do would be to expand the earned income tax credit, which has been quite effective in providing work incentives for women and to expand this for, for, for everyone um, who is a low-wage worker in a low-income family. Um, you know, there are a number of things in the stimulus bill which I think are the right things to do. We've expanded food stamp benefits, we've expanded unemployment, and it's not just benefit expansions, but expansions in eligibility. Um, we've done things to try to cover people who lose their jobs with health care. You know, the issue is all of those are temporary. And one of the really big political economy questions is two to three years from now when the economy is looking good, how many of those become permanent or do the, all of those get taken off? And, um, you know, some of them, you know, they, we, we can argue that some of them should get taken off. My reaction is some of them actually I would love to see um, la run more permanently. Would that help that group yeah. that you showed in the last, uh, the, the lowest mm -hmm. level, that big group that's increased yes. now, the yes. sort of losers yes. from welfare yes. reform? Yes, yes, definitely. You think it would help them? Yeah. Okay. You just talked about a tax change that actually helped uh, reduce yeah. inequality. Uh, what kind of tax changes do you think have driven if they have, rising inequality, and what fixes can you recommend? Yeah, so it's interesting. If you look at Europe post-World War II, um, there's this big wealth destruction, right? And that clearly um, lowered inequality. And, and, and Europe, by almost all measures, had much greater inequality than the US um, going into the 1940s. Um, and then post-World War II, um, almost all European nations put on much, much, very, very redistributional taxes, right? And this was all about rebuilding those countries. So they put on quite high tax levels, particularly on high wealth individuals. And there's obviously a lot of debate about whether that was good or bad, but the um, political economy and the urge to nation build to share that more equally um, was a really driving force for major redistributional taxation in Europe. And that long-term trend towards um, um, declining um, inequality in Europe. If it started in World War II, it was continued because of the political economy of, of, of highly redistributional taxes. Um, the US, of course, in the 1980s in the Reagan Revolution, um, you know, it, it actually started earlier than that, um, went the other way. And um, you know, a number of European countries have taken those high tax rates off, though they haven't gone anywhere near where we are, where we've created a much flatter tax system than most other countries. And um, I am, I guess, like Mr. Obama, um, in favor of making that tax system somewhat more redistributional, particularly in a world where the top end people have seen the type of income growth that they've seen. I have no problem saying let's raise taxes by, you know, three, five percent. We can talk about how much it's not. You know, I, I probably as an economist have difficulty going back to 70, 80, 90 percent tax rates, which um, the U.S. actually had at some point and many European nations had, but um, we're a long ways away from that. And um, I, I think some slightly greater redistributional taxes um, not only would help us fund a variety of national priorities, but you know, would also do something on this inequality front. You, you've yeah. talked about the 90th percentile. How about yeah. the 99th percentile? And mm -hmm. this gets at your yeah. discussion right there of taxes yeah. and increasing taxes. Is it the case that if we looked at that, it would even mm -hmm. be more inequality? That that's that's really that group has gotten an enormous amount more. Um, oh, I, you know, every place as you go up the distribution, you know, 
college educated have done better, but it's the people with more than a college degree, many of them sitting here in this room, who've really done well. Um, and it's a very particular group of that. There was someone who went in and tried to look at where were the really big wealth gains. Well, it turns out the really, you know, the people who are really making multi-billion dollars, they were all in the financial services industry. And it's one reason why um, this um, attention to financial services and banking and the lowering of executive salaries there actually could have a real impact on it because, because th this was the sector that was really the poster child for huge increases um, in, 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 in income and wealth. Um, so, so it, it's you know, every, you go to the top 10%, they had bigger increases than anyone else. You go to the top 5%, and the top 1% is just off the charts. And that's true all the way through the last 30 years. That this, you know, the top 1% is keeps pulling away, and the top one half of 1%, to the extent we have data on this, and we think our data is undercounted, um, is pulling away even faster. So, um, you know, the, all of those to me, you know, I'm, I'm Berkeley, so I guess I could say this here, um, you know, are, are arguments for saying, you know, we could afford slightly higher taxes on some of those groups even in the face of some of the wealth destruction we've seen. Uh, I would mention, yeah. by the way, that yeah. that's what we've done in California is rely yeah. upon yeah. those very, very high yeah. earning people to support our tax system. Yeah. But unfortunately, it has a problem with downturns. Yeah. That group declines yeah. quickly, and our tax yeah. revenues go down, and it can lead yeah. to other Absolutely. problems. Um, you mentioned uh, the gap between <laughs> high skilled versus low paid uh, laborers and the educational mm -hmm. differences between them and the skill levels. What can be done about that? Uh, what kind of things can be done to help workers, displaced workers, but workers in general, yeah. with those kinds of gaps? So um, any of you here who have not read the book, um, it, it's a book by Claudia Golden and Larry Katz, who are two economists at Harvard called The Race Between Education and Technology. Is that what it's called? Uh, those of you, I, 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 I'm going to get yeah. the title wrong. It's something very close to that. Um, it is a wonderful book. Claudia is a historian, and Larry is a labor economist, and they're both just top people at their game. And um, what it describes in the United States is, first of all, what the effect in the US was, was we pioneered um, public elementary schools. And then it describes what the effect in the US economically was when we pioneered public high schools. Um, and many European countries just, you know, why was the U.S. doing this? Why would you waste your resources to provide high school to everybody? I mean, every, you know, workers don't need high school, right? And then we were pioneering public universities, which were widely acceptable. And, you know, their claim is that there's, you know, these effects sequentially had not really raised the skill level within the United States over, you know, a whole century as these things went into place and were some of the primary causes for the, um, um, the, for the decline in inequality post-World War II as, as the effect of, of you know, more and more high school grads and then more and more college grads. And the GI Bill is part of the story as well. We're coming online. And then around the mid-1970s, this changes. And from the mid-1970s on, we have not made very much progress in terms of increases in educational levels. And uh, or, or we've made some progress, but not as much as you'd like. Um, and college going has actually sort of leveled out. It's continued to rise a little bit among women. It's been pretty flat among men for almost 20 years. And um, what has happened is while we were for years and years and years um, the most educated country in the, in the world, we are now falling behind badly many of our developed country competitors who are you know, showing continued increases. We're still at 22 to 25 percent of the population graduating with a college degree by age 25. There are a whole bunch of nations out there that are pushing past 40 percent and up towards 50 percent. And their claim is not only does this make the U.S. You know, just in the long run, this will not be the century of U.S. progress in technological and economic dominance, but you know, has very real effects. And, and that the story has to be to go back and make public education, particularly um, at the college level, accessible to a much broader spectrum of people. And that, of course, is not just a matter of colleges, but it's also a matter of particularly improving that subset of the elementary and secondary schools that are simply not performing well. And um, I mean, they, you know, they just make a lovely argument in the book that lays out, you know, it's not that you, you haven't seen this argument in other ways, but they lay this out in a historical perspective um, in a spectrum in a, in a way that I just think is, is just a marvelous piece of work. And, you know, if you want to come away convinced that what we need to do is invest in education in this country for long-term economic growth as well as, you know, if you care about some of these, you know, economic mobility and, and equality and, and, and opportunities for people at the bottom. Um, you know, it's all about education. You know, the anti-poverty stuff is the short-run stuff. The long-run stuff is all education. 
How about that? That maybe helps most new people yeah. entering in and making yeah. sure they're educated properly. Yeah. How about folks in mid-career yeah. who suddenly lose their jobs in a state like Michigan, for yeah. example? Yeah. What do we do with them? Those are real displaced workers. Yeah. So you know, there's a lot of research on displaced workers in the 1980s, and this is very similar in the sense that um, you know the 1980s was a real blue-collar recession, and it was a complete shakeout in manufacturing and traded goods. And there were certain sectors of the economy, the so-called Rust Belt, which got called the Rust Belt starting then, um, where you know jobs disappeared and they never came back. And what you're seeing now is, you know, the manufacturing jobs since the beginning of this recession, in 14 months, um, we've lost 12% of the manufacturing jobs in this country. And I can tell you that most of those aren't going to come back, um, you know, for better or for worse. And of course, the trouble is that the new jobs aren't sitting right next to them. You've got large numbers of people in places like Michigan and Ohio and now South and North Carolina um, that, um, you know, they, there aren't, there isn't immediate employment for people at their skill level. Um, so. The best analogies we have is what did we try to do in the 1980s, right? And I will tell you the news here isn't great. Um, on average, displaced workers never quite catch up to where they were before. And some of this is many of them were in plants where seniority matters. And once you lost your seniority at age 45, whatever you caught onto again, you never quite were as well off as you were before. It's one reason a lot of people simply retired early because you know they you know are sort of work part time jobs. Um, so I you know I have to say I think there's a number of people in this country who are going to take some long term hits. Um, as a result of this recession and what's happening with jobs. That might have happened anyway, but it would have happened much more slowly and not been quite so devastating for certain communities. And you know, if you know if the commu if it happens to the whole community, which has one or two plants, um, then you're really stuck, because then your only option is to move. We have tried doing relocation assistance. And you know, does it surprise anyone to know that people really aren't real enthusiastic about moving from the place they and their family have lived in for the last two to three generations? That's hard, right? And you and I wouldn't want to do that either. Um, and so, you know, relocation assistance is a good idea, and you ought to offer it, and you ought to encourage it, and you ought to provide people information and, and, and retraining assistance as well. But retraining and relocation, once a worker is 40 with a family um, and, you know, sort of, you know, settled in, you know, a particular type of job, um, just isn't as effective as we wish. There are no magic bullets here. And some number of people are going to pay much bigger prices as a result of this recession than others. That's not a reason not to do retraining, not to do relocation. We should be providing, um, for, you know, this should all be part of an unemployment insurance system, which actually gives people some support for that type of retraining, and particularly right now. And you guys in California know this better than anyone. I mean, I was appalled when I heard that the California system was going to cut 10% of the openings in its classes uh, because of budget cuts. Well, what's the best time to get more people into college and build skills? Well, unemployment is high. There's no opportunity cost. People are unemployed anyway. N you know, now is the time to actually deficit fund. You know, if you're going to deficit fund, and, and I realize states can't do this, so it has to be done jointly. Yeah, with so the we could take a vote on this. My yeah. guess is this audience I, <laughs> would agree with you. But you know, this is really short-term stupid. Um, to not take this economy, this bad economy, as a way right. to get more people through skills for a longer right. period of time. Yes, you're, yeah. you're yeah, preaching yeah, I, I, to the yeah, converted. I, 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 I know, I know, I know. Um, yeah. you're, you're, you're in Washington right now, and the, yeah. the thing that struck me about the yeah. president's budget was, first of all, that it was really sort of very programmatic. Yeah. But second of all, it had that picture of yeah. rising income yeah. inequality. And then soon thereafter, the Republicans mm -hmm. start talking about how he advocates mm -hmm. socialism and redistribution yeah. and all these kinds yeah. of things. What's your sense of the mood there? Is the Republicans complain about this? Is it going to take hold in a Ronald Reagan kind of way? Or does that just seem like gibberish to a lot well, of Well, yeah, it's a question. Does the political environment retain the Reagan era yeah. hostility? Or do we actually go along with uh, more redistribution and uh, the acceptance of higher taxes? Um, I, I think we fundamentally don't know at this point. I think it could go either way. I think leadership will matter. I think um, with Mr. Obama as president, it makes it a little bit more likely that there might be an acceptance of some more, a little more redistribution, slightly higher taxes, and the Democratic Congress is going to help that. But you know, people for a long time have been told, you know, uh, you know, this is not just the Republicans. Um, you know, you can cut taxes, and, and we don't have to cut spending. And you know, and, and so we can have it all. And that's just not true. That's particularly not true with the aging problems that we're facing in this economy. And um, will the American public, will that get through to them? And will they sort of accept economic reality there? Or will our politicians do us a continuing disservice by you know, saying no, you know, what we really should be doing is cutting taxes. One thing Mr. Obama, I think, has been very savvy about doing, I think partly because he believes this, but partly because it's good politics. So you know, every time he talks about this recession and fiscal stimulus, he also talks about the fact there's a big budget deficit looming. And 
once this fiscal stimulus period is over and the economy is growing again, we're going to tackle the budget deficit. So on the one hand, I, A, I think that's true, and I think he has to keep that in front of us. It's clear he believes this deeply, and he's put people in place, you know, like his head of OMB, who are all about deficit, getting rid of budget deficits. B, however, it's good politics in the following way. To the extent the main argument the Republicans are making, those who are saying, let's do nothing, there's the other group that's saying, no, if you're going to do anything, cut taxes. That's the best stimulus, OK? So cutting taxes provides a certain amount of stimulus. You can't, quite honestly, the more you cut taxes, at some point you're pushing on a steering and people are putting it under the mattress. They're not spending it. So there is a limit to how much stimulus you get out of that. But the other reason you can't cut taxes is because of this looming deficit. You know, and in the short run, even if you thought, if you had two choices of old-fashioned fiscal government spending versus cutting taxes, if you didn't have a government deficit out there, you, know, you might be willing to do a different mix of those. But the fact you've got the deficit out there, you've got an immediate answer to those who say, let's just cut taxes more, which is that we can't because we've got a second problem that's hitting us in the face. And cutting taxes goes exactly the wrong way on that second problem. And I think uh, Obama has been masterful at saying both of those at the same time all the way through. And I have to say, I have not heard the opposition vocalize what I thought was an effective response to that, other than just by ignoring it. So. Well, we have a reception coming up. And I thank you for coming. And Rebecca, it was right. great. Thank you.